We begin with God's name, the abundantly gracious and endlessly compassionate, peace be upon you. Once more, we have gathered to offer a weekly interactive question and answer session featuring Javed Ahmad Gamdi for your guidance and viewing pleasure. Our deepest gratitude, Gamdi Sahab, for giving us your time. Over the past few weeks, we have discussed a pressing concern with you. For almost everyone in Muslim societies, when they reach maturity, be it regarding social or political engagements, or engagement with sacred literature, the mention of Palestine resonates widely. Its significance deeply resonates with Muslims too. And every now and then, we keep observing the events that unfold in this matter. Your insights have been guiding us, shedding light on Palestine's historical background, its spiritual, religious, and geopolitical significance. You shared your extensive insights with us, spanning over two hours. My intention is to extend this discussion, starting with a few preliminary inquiries. Could you further clarify your observations on the chronological evolution of this territory, especially regarding the sacred edifices established here? It is believed their foundation was laid by Prophet Solomon, peace be upon him. Could you trace the history of these religious sanctuaries through different periods, namely the erection of the temple and its subsequent demolition? Thereafter, its Islamic stewardship is supposed to have followed. So what ensued afterward for these sacred sites and what is their current status to this day? Advancing this dialogue, we will explore potential resolutions we may also be able to address some doubts and questions. It has been previously established that Palestine is not an ordinary place. It stands unique among the world's various regions. God Almighty had selected it, and it has been termed it as the sacred land in the Quran. I have explained that such a designation signifies that God Almighty's special regard for this territory, this piece of earth, this locale for himself. Why is this territory distinguished? Its entire narrative has been conveyed to you. Moreover, I have mentioned that according to God Almighty's verdict, when the time arrived for appointing the final messenger to the Israelites, Jesus peace be upon him being the last prophet for Israelites and with the culmination of God's judgment, God Almighty permanently relieved them of their prior role for which they were positioned in Palestine for which they had been sent into Palestine, for which this region had been made special for them. It was based on this role that the directives which are found today in the Torah or echoed in the Quran were also given to them. Viewing from this angle, for the Jewish community, the religious status of Palestine ceased the instant they rejected Jesus' peace be upon him, rather they attempted to crucify him. Thus, the divine verdict of punishment was decreed. I've elaborated that this punishment had two dimensions to it. That is, one, it came in the way that it is applicable to every prophet's nation. Hence, it also befell them in 70 CE, with the Romans unleashing their wrath thoroughly. The historical accounts of their actions are horrifying, and they describe their complete expulsion, the destruction of the temple, and the desecration of their sacred texts. The punishment had occurred initially as well, during Nebuchadnezzar's assault, and then once again later. The second facet was also discussed by me. As God's chosen people, they were entrusted with a mission and appointed as witnesses unto God. Their situation was unlike general nations to whom prophets were sent. Another decree that was given regarding them was that until the day of judgment, those associated with Jesus, peace be upon him, those who claim to follow him would persist in dominating and reigning over them. So in this respect, it had become quite clear that the Jewish religious claim over Palestine was conclusively terminated. I am talking about the religious claim. Next, I will elaborate on various other bases of entitlement but their religious claim had ceased. As you mentioned, a mosque had been established. This mosque was founded by God's prophets. And as per traditions within our Hadith corpus, we come to know that Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, had laid this mosque's foundation. It is recorded that he first reconstructed the house of God in Mecca and settled Ishmael there. And thereafter, his second lineage, the Bani Ishaq, were inhabited in Palestine. 
they were to migrate to Egypt later. But in Prophet Abraham's time, they were present here. He had established a foundation for a place of worship, that is, the location was designated and a site for worship was established, or it can be said that the prayer site was demarcated. That is, with regard to the worship site, it is not a question of erecting a structure. Structures are built, they exist, sometimes they may be demolished or destroyed. We are talking about the location that was chosen. This place has been established as a mosque. Thus, when a prophet of Allah designates a location, its status as a mosque endures until the end of time. That means it's not just any mosque. This isn't just any other mosque. In ordinary mosques, the decision is made by us. That is, we determine a spot for establishing a place of worship or deciding upon a location for a mosque. In these, we engage in prayers and worship. Sometimes logistical reasons or public benefit may necessitate a change of location, but only under extreme necessity, because any place of worship holds a special sanctity. Yet, if a place of worship is founded by a messenger of Allah and by God's command, its status remains unchanged until the end of time. Thus, the religious significance of Palestine has ended, that is, for the land of Palestine, its religious significance has ceased to be. Following the mission of Jesus, peace be upon him, it was concluded. Nevertheless, a mosque remains a mosque. Whether we call it a masjid, prayer space, ma'bad, or something else, the Temple of Solomon is so named because of its grandeur. Yet, it is essentially a mosque, and its status is affirmed by God Almighty himself. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. This verse clearly establishes this, and I had clarified that masjid al-aqsa is not the name of a building, but the name of a piece of land spread over many acres, which was demarcated by Allah, which was established by Abraham, peace be upon him. Later, when the Israelites settled here, despite centuries having passed, Prophet David began the construction of a mosque, and Prophet Solomon finished constructing this structure. Therefore, this mosque is established by Allah and will forever be a mosque. Its status as a mosque is beyond challenge, and this is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, stated that there are three places in the world where one can journey with a religious intent in the form of conducting a pilgrimage. One is the holy house of God, masjid haram or what we call Kaabatullah. The second is this mosque in Palestine, and the third is the mosque of the Holy Prophet himself. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, established the mosque of the Holy Prophet. And if the tradition is authentic, it says that these other two mosques were established by Prophet Abraham, God's peace be upon him. Yet, even if there's doubt, we can say that the two prophets of Allah, David, peace be upon him, and Solomon, peace be upon him, established Al-Aqsa. Therefore, a mosque's status is immutable. That is, a mosque established by a prophet of Allah remains a mosque until the end of time. It cannot be converted into an idol house, nor can other structures be built upon it. Its status is preserved. Consider the mosque of the Holy Prophet. Initially, it was a small structure. We know and even today, its original foundation is still discernible. That original platform has been preserved to its original dimensions as it was in the Prophet's time. Yet, has the mosque remained confined to just that size? Clearly, it has greatly expanded. Similarly, if you read about the conditions during the Prophet's era, the extent of the Kaaba was up to the stone at Makameh Ibrahim. That is the point from where the houses of the Quraysh began. They would illuminate it with lamps placed on their walls. Umar, may Allah have mercy on him, first cleared those houses to expand the mataf, that is, the circumambulation area. Thus, the mosque expanded and may continue to do so, but it remains a mosque until the end of time. So, these are distinct matters, meaning the exclusive religious status of Palestine 
concluded with Jesus peace be upon him while it continues to remain a mosque and it shall remain so till judgment day and these are two different things the significance of the land of Palestine ended with Prophet Jesus for the Jews its religious significance also ended for us it never held nor will hold religious significance for us the Arabian Peninsula is religiously significant. For us, refers to the Muslim Ummah established by Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, which originated from the Ishmaelites. Muhammad, peace be upon him, an Ishmaelite himself, established the Kaaba, the center of monotheism. Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Prophet of God, was himself among the Ishmaelites. This house, that is the holy house of God, was established by Abraham, peace be upon him. Now this house is the center of the oneness of God. This very land with God's sanctification is special to God. Regarding it are the commands of God. Yakunadin kuluhulila, meaning forever will Allah's religion abide here. And this objective was achieved during the times of the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself. After its attainment, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that now, until Judgment Day, la yajtamehu fihi dinan, this statement indicates the unique religious status. If the religious status is clear for both matters, then I had previously said that God Almighty has bestowed this honor upon the Muslims since they devoted their hearts and souls in the path of God, which we learn from the history of the Companions. The appointment of the last prophet of God took place in the land of Arabia. There, it was decided that the verdict of God, which is given for those nations who are sent with prophets and has been implemented by the angels, will be carried out by the Sahaba. Yuadzebu humulahu bi'aidikum. And when it was implemented, in return, God Almighty gave this land, or rather several other regions, under the rule of the Muslims. I have mentioned that the completion of the proof by the Prophet, peace be upon him, that is, the completion of the proof which the Prophet, peace be upon him, had directly conducted upon the addressees, is known from the Quran as well as from history that it was done in three stages. Firstly, it was done on the Quraysh, which the Quran has stated in a manner that you have been appointed for the reason that we have decided to send a prophet among the Gentiles. And he was told of his first mission, Li Tunzara, Ummul Qura wa Man Hawlaha, meaning the Quraysh who are settled in Makkah should have the completion of arguments of Allah on them. They should be forewarned, including the areas in the vicinities as well. This was the first stage. The second stage started when the prophet, peace be upon him, migrated to Yathrib, which we call the city of the prophet. After relocating there, the people of the book, Jews and Christians, were addressed. They have been addressed in the first part of the Quran. The first group comprises Bakara, Ale Imran, Nisa, and Maida. There, the completion of the arguments of God had been done on the people of the scriptures. The third stage started when, four years before departing from the world, the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent letters to the kingdoms of the surrounding regions. And I had said that the Sassanid and the Byzantine Empire existed then. That is, two superpowers were existing. The remaining were their satellite and dependent rulers. Some subordinate clients and vassals were there. In those times, it was usual that when large empires would come into existence, then some of their nearby regions would have relatively independent kingdoms and some would be subservient to them, and some would sustain themselves as a result of accords. Hence, the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent the letters to those powerful emperors, that is, he sent letters to the Caesar and Cyrus as well, and along with it, he sent letters to the heads of the governments of the remaining six smaller kingdoms. Therefore, the Prophet encompassed the entire region, and then, as per the law of completion of the proof, provided a period of four years. In those four years, they had the opportunity to come to see and meet. 
the last Prophet of Allah. If they had any queries, they were welcome. Whatever stages were to come, their opportunity was afforded to them. After this opportunity, the Sahaba were deputed by the Prophet, peace be upon him, that they issue the final ultimatum for either accepting Iman or paying jizya. Otherwise, they were to get ready for the battle. And this was the application of that command of the Quran, which had been ordained for the people of the scriptures of the Arabian Peninsula. Ahata yutul jizyata an yadin wahum sagirun. So I have stated this. What was its consequence? Its consequence was that this whole region was handed over to the Ishmaelites with his blessing and grace. And after that, what happened? That trust, meaning the position of being the witness which had been awarded to the Jews earlier, the center of which was the land of Palestine, which had been selected for the universal propagation of the Dawah for Tawheed, that whole trust had been transferred to the Ishmaelites. Along with it, a practical outcome was that even the land of Palestine and several other regions became a part of the Muslim empire during the era of Umar. May God's mercy be upon him. This empire was established as the result of the conquests, and the command which had been issued for the conquests was based purely on a religious basis that the Prophet, peace be upon him, of God Almighty, had completed the process of completion of the proof. Now, after it is over, these deniers had no excuse left. When the completion of arguments has been carried out by the Prophet of Allah, those are either wiped away from the face of the earth or they are to live in subordination. This is the summary of that point. Hence, I had narrated to you the history and told you that since then it had remained with Muslims except for a period of more or less a century, that is, in 1099 CE when it was conquered by the Crusaders. They established a Christian state of Jerusalem, which remained until later also, and then in 1187 CE, Salah Uddin reconquered it for the Muslims. And then it remained as a nation or a region of the Muslims where generally the Muslim governors were deputed, and the period in which all this took place, the Fatimids ruled there. And later on, when the Caliphate was transferred to the Ottomans, then it came under their control and remained under the control of the Ottomans until the end, the period which we shall now talk about. I have also narrated this history previously. I have summarized it again for you. Excuse me. The divine law, which is stated in the Quran, is tilka layamunu dawiluha bainan nas, meaning God changes the world order and hands power to different groups by turn. The great governments of the world are formed Great nations emerge one after the other for them too. The divine law is that the world is their place of judgment. Hence, the Quran has stated it, and it has said, وَإِن مِّن قَرْيَةٍ إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُهْلِكُوهَا قَبْلَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُوهَا عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا Meaning that whichever nation has appeared on the stage of this world, for it, our law, is إِلَّا نَحْنُ مُهْلِكُوهَا Ultimately, a moment comes when we take them to their death. Muhlikuha. And this will go on till Judgment Day, Kabla Yawm al and this chain will continue till the Day of Judgment. Else, what happens? Aumuazibuha azaban shadida. Either they face the severest of the torment, like the nations of the Prophets had experienced. And it was said, Kana zalika fil kitabi mastura. This is the divine law written by Allah. It is the fate written by Allah. This is a practice of God. It has to compulsorily manifest itself. This manifestation took place in the case of Muslims as well. Its causes emerge. The way it happens, it also happened for Muslims. The torment of God has ended for the reason that the appointment of the prophets won't be there. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came in the capacity of the last prophet. The completion of the proof was completed and its consequences were seen. Now, the book and the deen given by him, which will now have the status of the book and the religion of God as a reference frame for people till judgment day. This matter is closed. So the matter of Aumuazibuha Azaban Shadida ended, however, 
muhlikuha, this chain will continue. And in this, different nations would appear on the world stage. This destruction happens gradually. Like the way we see a child being born passes through the stage of childhood and adolescence, after which he grows into adulthood, and a time comes when he addresses the world as a mature intellect like Aristotle or Plato. And then the stages of decline come, old age comes, and after that, as the Quran has stated, Likaila yalamun min badi ilmin shaya, he forgets everything and then dies on reaching old age. So the affairs of the nations also are in the same manner. When this happens, its conditions develop. That is, in the way we see a person, we say, look, now he is getting sick, the strength is declining, now the weakness is growing. All these things take place with the passing of age. Similar are the stages with the nations. So what are the factors that become the reason for it? What are those things? When God Almighty chooses a nation, then according to me, there are three things that become its basis. Those become the basis for any nation to remain on its zenith and also become the basis for its weakness and downfall. What is the first thing among them? Where does the nation stand as regards knowledge and morality? Knowledge and morality are, in fact, the guarantee of survival in this world. That knowledge which we acquire through experiments and experience and which you call science in the modern period. Its foundations are very ancient. So where do you actually stand with respect to knowledge? The second is the moral existence of human beings. And the real manifestation of the moral existence in the case of nations lies in their collective morality. So where does a nation stand as per the standards of knowledge and morality? Whether they are at a superior level or are they at a moderately good position? Whether the situation is satisfactory? Whether they are on a declining course? Or whether they have reached the point of maximal decline? All this is seen. The second thing is that which you call a nation obviously will have a basis for its formation. So its political unity needs to sustain. When a nation is divided into smaller tribes, each tribe having its own chief, each tribe has its own place, then it becomes difficult to even apply the word nation for them. And suppose you continue to apply that term, then that will just be a work of imagination that would remain suspended in the air. You will not see any of its effects on the ground. Those effects occur only under the condition when there exists a political unity among them. That is, they may be tribes, individuals, people scattered in different places. However, a unified political entity exists, and this political entity should be clearly evident. It is not just a work of imagination, which you form in your mind, so you may think this too will have the same effect. That political unison actually provides strength to it. Based on it, its strength comes into existence. As whatever knowledge of the world you possess, or the moral strength that you have, that finds ways of its manifestations in the world in tandem with its material strength. So, the manifestation of material strength lies in political unity. And the third point is if the basis of that nation is based on an ideology or, in plain words you say, taking the case of us Muslims. Obviously, we are called Muslims because we believe in a religion. So, if the basis of a nation is based on an ideology, then with regard to that ideology or that religion, how focused are they? That is, if the situation there is one of discord everywhere, there does not exist any basis for judgments. Then, obviously, weakness would set in. So, these three things are absolutely imperative. These three are the indispensable elements. After this, a nation can sustain its superiority. When weakness will come in them, it might be in one or the second or the third. Then it will gradually start going down. And the other nations of the world need not necessarily be at the peak in all these matters. If they are better at them, then gradually their superiority will also be established. So, if this point clear, then note here the third point. I would like to elucidate a little further. God Almighty has stated it too. 
when it was said in Surah Shura that their religion is the religion of all prophets and the Prophet peace be upon him was addressed and said, It has been given to you. So what was said along with it? Anakimudin wala tatafarakufi. Now be steadfast to act on it. And this obedience should be done with absolute single-mindedness. Wala tatafarakufi. This was stated. The whole of the Muslim Ummah was told that this focus cannot be achieved in parts by different groups. Udkulu fis silmi kaffa. All of you should together be steadfast with their religion. What was the method told for this? Etasibu bihablilahi jamiam wala tafarraku. That is, hold on to the rope of God with strength. What will be the inevitable result of it? You will be clear of conflicts. You will be away from sectarianism and you will not lose focus with respect to deen. What is that rope of Allah? The Prophet, peace be upon him, has elucidated it and it was made clear from the Quran that it is the book of Allah, the Quran. Regarding the Quran itself, the Quran has elaborated that this is the book which, when made the focus of your attention, the source of your strength, the book which you accept as your judge, whose judgments will be accepted by you and for each and everything, you will treat it as furqan, meaning criterion, and mizan, meaning scale, then alone you will be single-minded with regard to your deen. This is the basis of focus. It does not at all imply that there won't be any differences. Those discords will come under an umbrella. That is, for you a basis would be provided where if at all some minor issue comes up, it will keep getting resolved on a continuous basis. However, if this status of the Book of God diminishes among us Muslims, then there are endless dissensions. There, someone will hold on to something, while some other will hold on to something else. Someone's source of guidance will be based on human imaginations. With it, the philosophical discourses will enter into the deen, and which will further add various kinds of theologies. Some will make it as a base for the formulation of their metaphysics, which will result in the development of mystical groups. Likewise, someone will cling on to narrations, while others will use history to form ideas. So when you will accept the Book of God as your Hakim, meaning ruler, and as a Furkan, meaning criterion, I cited these as examples then what will be achieved? A single-mindedness with regard to your deen. And this focus actually should be with respect to all realms of knowledge. So these are the three points. Now you yourself can see at a glance that the setting in of the weakness, that is, I have narrated to you its history. Smaller provinces came into existence where the different sultans started to make themselves independent to a large extent. They didn't even remain accountable to anybody. They exceeded in status as they were no longer, say, governors of a large province. The Mughal kingdom came under the emperors and there wasn't anything of that sort there. Although a symbolic status did remain of the political unity of the Muslims, which was in the form of the Khilafat of the Ottomans. It began in 1517 CE and that remained, however, with a symbolic status for centuries. That is, it has its period of being at its zenith and in the last days or before it fell prey to weakness. The factors of weakness are these, which I have just stated in front of you. That is, gradually the political unity ended. The real political unity had existed earlier, which slowly turned into symbolic unity. And then after that, in a way, that too came to an end. That we saw among the Fatimids, we also saw it among the Abbasids in their last phase. We also saw it in the Abbasid Khilafat of Cairo. And finally, the same situation arose among the Ottomans. The tales of Spain and Andalusia are recounted by people and even today lament and mourn for it. In this manner, more or less the political unison ended, or you may term it as the complete exhaustion of its strength. The Safavids had their own rule earlier too in Iran and later on, the Russian Empire started their offensive against them. Gradually, the old Persia also lost its splendor. This is the political history in which the political unity was gradually disintegrating. Look at the second point. 
with regard to knowledge and morality, that is, we had been in a commanding position. If you begin from the companions, what did the Quran say? Even God Almighty praised them. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. That is, all the Sahaba, companions, weren't of the same level. All of them were not Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, and Ali. Despite all this, the whole group was called Kaira Umatin, that is, they were the best of people with regard to knowledge as well as morality. Then in the later stages, you saw the periods of Harun and Mamun. You also saw the advancement of knowledge in Spain. You also had the opportunity to witness the moral superiority of people on various measures taken at the time. Then the gradual decline started here too. That is, the knowledge too slipped from their hands. And with regard to morality, the Muslims gradually followed the course of decline from superiority to moderately good and then comparatively acceptable. And in the end, what followed? The march was towards the abject lowness in knowledge and morality. And the religious unity ended too, for the reason that the Book of Allah neither remained as the locus for the knowledge of the Muslims, nor did it remain as the axis for their actions and practice. This is the situation of the present times as well. All three aspects became the basis for the decline of the majestic empire of the Muslims that had come into being and their dominance in the world. And through them, that era had come into existence, which is called the, the Age of Faith. This schematic which Will Durant used is absolutely right. If you observe carefully, this is the period of the peak of the teachings of the two prophets. On one side is Jesus, peace be upon him. His followers attained this status in the Roman Empire, and we saw their grandeur, their position, and the nature of the empire, and the powers acquired by the Christian Church. On the other end, the followers of the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you look carefully, the superiority that had been attained was of the being of God. Religion was the source and guide of knowledge, and the world was being governed by it too. And the same points which I discussed when weakness crept in all the three, then ultimately they had to meet this fate that the decree for their destruction was signed. To what extent that would be is something else. It hasn't been with the Muslims to that degree. How the judgment for this destruction was made, and in comparison to it, how the different nations surfaced, we should have a glance at that too, so that we see as to what happened when Palestine slipped out of the hands of Muslims. You elaborated upon this point in great detail today that the complete issue of the land of Palestine, where do we stand in it? And the factors that you ascertained for the rise and fall are undoubtedly the points to ponder upon. We are taking the discussion along. We are analyzing the whole issue politically, historically, and religiously. Now, the important aspect in which the most significant point is, where do we stand today historically? And to resolve this issue, what are the contemporary political measures and what is the international scenario? And what are your views about all this? We shall bring it into the next discussion, God willing. We are finished with our time for now. Inshallah, tomorrow we shall be at your service again. Thank you very much for your time till now.